Hey everyone, Zeb here. Just going to build on what we've been doing in the last installment of the constrained optimization series. In the last video, we looked at the Cobb Douglas utility function and we solved for the consumer's optimal consumption bundle using the property that in equilibrium, generally the marginal rate of substitution is going to be equal to the slope of the budget line. So we were able to use that to help us find the optimal consumption bundle. That is where the indifference curve is tangent to the uh, budget line. But we can also solve this without using any kind of graphics or any kind of tricks to help us with essentially brute force. And one way to do that is using what's called Lagrangian optimization. Now Lagrangian optimization is used not only in economics, but in lots of different situations where you have some kind of objective function that you wish to maximize, but you're constrained and you're constrained by whatever. Well, in this case, the objective function that we wish to maximize is our utility function, and we're constrained by the consumer's budget. So the first thing that I want to do just to make our life easier is to take the a monotonic transformation, essentially, of this utility function. Now, remember, if you take a monotonic transformation of a utility function, you're left with exactly the same preferences. So your solution is going to be the same. So the monotonic transformation that I'm going to take, I'll call this u hat of x1, x2, is namely that I'm going to take the natural log of each of my goods here. So if you remember your properties of natural logs, right, if you have something like x1 to the a, then the natural log of that is going to be a times the natural log of x1. All right, so we can rewrite this having taken the natural log with respect, uh, taking the natural log of x1 and taking the natural log of x2. And so we get a times little a x1, whoops, hang on, not quite. Get a little ahead of myself there. The natural log of x1 plus, now we do the same thing for x2, a times b times the natural log of x2. So here is our new utility function, and it is a monotonic transformation of the first, and so the preferences are going to be exactly the same. So this is our objective function. Now, of course, the constraint is the one that we are familiar with. Um, that is the budget constraint. So we're going to set up our Lagrangian equation. And so we usually use some kind of fancy L to indicate that this is a Lagrangian. And we start just with our objective function, namely that a, a, ln, x1, plus a, b, ln, x2, right? There is our objective function. Now, we are going to subtract lambda, which is what we call the Lagrangian multiplier, and I'll talk about the meaning of lambda in just a minute, times now our budget constraint. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to kind of think backwards about this. We're going to start with our income. We're going to subtract away our spending on good one, P1, X1, and subtract away our spending on good two, P2, X2. So if you think about it, in optimum, the value of the things here inside the bracket should be zero, right? Because we want to spend all of our income on these goods. Now, in this case, we only have one constraint, and that's the budget constraint. But of course, you could have multiple constraints, and then you would have multiple lambdas. Uh, but in this case, we just have one. So now, we are going to take some derivatives. We're going to use some calculus here. And we're going to take the derivative of this Lagrangian function with respect to x1, with respect to x2, and with respect to lambda. All right, so we're going to get these first order conditions, or they're sometimes called Kuhn Tucker conditions. So our Kuhn Tucker conditions, or our first order conditions here of this problem, the first one is going to be the derivative of L with respect to good one. Well, this is pretty easy. We simply get A times lowercase a. Now, the derivative of x1, or the natural log of x1, is just going to be 1 over x1. Now we see there's no, there's no x1 in the second part of the objective function. Come over to the constraint and we see that we have negative lambda times negative p1x1. 
right? Well, of course, negative lambda times negative P1 is just going to be a positive, so plus lambda P1. And the first order condition is that this is going to be equal to zero. And so let's move some of this stuff up and out of the way. Okay. For whatever reason, Lagrangian optimization doesn't want to go. Okay, there it goes. Now, let's take the derivative of L with respect to good 2. And so here we get A times B times 1 over x2 plus lambda p2, and all of that equal to zero. That's the first order condition or the Kuhn-Tucker condition. Now the last derivative that we're going to take is going to be the partial of L with respect to lambda. All right, now this one's pretty easy because everything is just, uh, the only time that lambda enters in is in the constraint, and so everything that's in the constraint gets multiplied by lambda. And notice what we get here. So we get negative m plus p1x1 plus p2x2 is equal to zero. Now if you think about what that says, that says that my spending on good one and good two has to be equal to my income, which is pretty clear, right? We expected that to be the case, that we would fully exhaust our income on this problem. So the easiest thing to do here is to just solve for lambda. That's the best thing that we can do. So let's take this condition here and solve out for lambda. So we get a a 1 over x1 equals negative lambda p1. So we can divide both sides by p1. And so we get a a 1 over x1 over p1 equals negative lambda. And so, of course, we get that lambda equals negative a a 1 over x1 over p1. All right now, we could change that. We could simplify it a little bit, but we still have to work with this. So we'll just leave it there for now. And we can do the same thing here with the second first order condition, or the second Kuhn-Tucker condition. And so we get a b1 over x2 equals minus lambda p2. All right, so we can divide both sides by p2, and we get a b1 over x2 over p2 is equal to negative lambda. So then we know that lambda is going to be equal to negative a b1 over x2 divided by p2. All right, so we're starting to get somewhere. We have actually solved for lambda now in terms of A's, big A's, a little a, a little b, prices, p1 and p2, and the amounts of good x1 and x2. So we've got rid of the lambda, which is pretty nice. Now remember what we're trying to solve for. We're trying to solve for the optimal amount of consumption, x1 and x2. So let's move some more stuff. Move this up. So now what we want to do is we want to solve either for x1 or x2. Now, so we could do this any way that we want to. Um, but we know that lambda equals negative a, big A, little a, 1 over x1 over p1. And it also equals negative a, b, 1 over x2 over p2. So we can set these two equal to each other. right? We know from what we've just found that, and because both of these have a negative, we can just do away with the negative signs. So we have a, a, 1 over x1 over p1 equals a, b, 1 over x2 over, that was pretty sloppy, over p2. So there we have it. So we can solve here for uh, either x1 or x2. It really doesn't matter. All right, so let's actually solve for x2. I think that that makes the most sense. So we'll solve for x2, and you'll see why I say that um, shortly. So one thing that we can do 
is start off by canceling out things that we can get rid of. And so notice we have an A here on both sides. So we can simply cancel that out. Now this is also worth noting that we can rewrite what we have here as A over P1 times 1 over X1 equals B over P2 times 1 over X2. And that might be helpful for us uh, to think about it this way. So if we're trying to solve for X2, we're going to divide both sides by B over P2. Well, of course, dividing by B over P2 is the same as multiplying by P2 over B. So we get P2 over B times A over P1 times 1 over X1 is equal to 1 over X2. But of course, we didn't want to solve for 1 over X2. We wanted to actually solve for X2. So we need to flip this over. And so we get that X2 is going to be equal to B over P2 times P over A, which P is that? P1 over A times X1 over 1 equals X2. All right, so there we go. We now have an X2. And we can take this, we have X2 in terms of parameters of the model and, and, and as a function of X1. We know that we're going to exhaust our budget, so we can plug this into our budget constraint, namely this third equation here. So we can plug that into our budget constraint. And so we get, if we do this, right, we're going to plug in our, this X2, so we get our budget constraint is P1X1 plus P2 now times this mess for X2. So we get B over P2 times P1 over A X1. And that's going to be equal to M. Okay, notice we are multiplying by a P2 and dividing by a P2. That's going to cancel out, right? So those cancel out. And so we can rewrite this as P1 X1 plus B times P1 over A X1 equals M. So believe it or not, uh, we are starting to get somewhere. All right. Understand that this is, of course, I wish I would stop resizing here with my palm. So this is, of course, P1 X1 plus, I'm going to rewrite this just, just a little bit, B over A P1 X1 equals M. So let's bring our X1 out. All right, we're going to factor that out. So if we factor X1 out, we get X1 now times this P1, so there's a P1 there, plus, and now we've got this B over A, P1. And that's going to be equal to M. So let's move this up and out of the way. Now we can solve for M. Uh, sorry, M. We don't want to solve for M, we want to solve for X1. Just checking to make sure you're following along. So X1 star, that is our optimal amount, of good one is going to be M over P plus B over A P1. And of course, this was um, a P1 as well. Okay. And now we can factor this a little bit more if we want. Uh, you could leave it there or you can continue to um, simplify this a little bit. And so we will. Let's pull out this P1. And so we get that this is M over P1 times 1 plus B over A, which is, of course, equal to M over P1 times 1 over 1 plus B over A. Now this should look familiar 
because this is very similar to what we've seen in the previous video. In fact, it's exactly the same thing, right? Because this can be rewritten as M over P1 times A over A plus B. And that is exactly the same result that we found in the previous video using the marginal rate of substitution equals to the uh, slope of the budget line. And so we can do the same exact same thing here, uh, solving for good two, the optimal amount of good two. And I will let you think about that on your own because this video has already gone long enough. But this is the technique for solving this using the Lagrangian. And of course, remember, this is a um, this is a symmetric problem. So once you've figured out what good one is, hopefully you can see that good two, the optimal amount of good two, is going to be kind of the symmetric. So PM over P2 times now B over A plus B. And so this is exactly what we found using the other approach. This is just a little more, uh, a little more calculation, a little more calculus here. So our final answer is going to be the optimal amount of good one, M over P1 times A over A plus B, comma, M over P2 times B over A plus B. So there you have it. The constrained optimization problem for the Cobb-Douglas utility function solved two ways. In this video, we looked at the Lagrangian optimization approach, and in the previous version, we solved it, I think, the easier way. But it's good to know that sometimes there's more than one way to go about a problem. Thank you for watching.